Innovation. It's one of those words we've nearly worn out, turning it into a generic catch-all buzzword in business operations, marketing, education, and the media. There's an ever-increasing demand for new ways of thinking and smarter ways of working. Pressure from your customers who want better products. Pressure from your executives who want new revenue streams or cost avoidance measures. Even pressure from your team members who need a better process to manage bigger workloads or new responsibilities. But as a buzzword, innovation can feel so nebulous, it's hard to know where to start. The thing is, innovation is actually a specific business practice and an important one at that. Can an organization get by without innovating? Maybe. Can an organization thrive and sustain itself well into the future without innovation? Doubtful. Having a system in place to experiment with new ideas can help your organization make real progress. And that's what our guests are here to talk about on this episode of the Performance Matters Podcast. Are you ready to perform at your highest potential? Welcome to the Performance Matters Podcast from GP Strategies, your workforce transformation partner. In each episode, we'll interview industry experts and explore best practices and innovative insights to help your organization improve performance. James Carpenter is a principal business consultant for GP Strategies, specializing in organizational change management, sales optimization, agile program management, and large-scale project management. His expertise encompasses retail, global manufacturing, telecommunications, global food services, defense contracting, and technology. Rocky Ellens holds a master's degree in human resources and organizational development. His expertise in organizational effectiveness sees him consulting on difficult transformational initiatives stemming from technology or process changes. Throughout Rocky's 20-year consulting career, he's supported clients including finance, insurance, aerospace, e-commerce, software development, and more. Hello and welcome to the GP Performance Matters podcast. I'm your host, Michael Thiel, a creative director serving on the GP Innovation Team. And today we're talking about a topic near and dear to my heart, and that is the practice of innovation. What it can do for the organization and how you can get started setting up your very own innovation test and learn factory. James and Rocky, on behalf of our global listening audience, thank you for carving out time today to talk about this practice of innovation. How are you gentlemen doing? Hey, I'm doing great. Great. We're happy to be here. Well, we are honored to have you. So the first thing I want to do before we get into the meat and potatoes is just figure out where in the heck in the world are James and Rocky. So James, let's start with you now. We are doing this as a podcast, but we are looking at each other in a virtual studio. You've got one of the coolest backgrounds I've ever seen. So I'm dying to know, where are you in the world? Well, I think if you threw a dart at the map of the United States and hit the center, that's where I'm at. So I'm just outside of Wichita, Kansas. Nice. Nice. Wichita, Kansas. I've never been there, but um, it's by the by the look of your background, it looks like a pretty fantastic place to be. <laughs> Thanks. It is. Rocky, Rocky, how about you? Where are you at, sir? I'm from a little town called Orlando, Florida. Have you ever heard of it? <laughs> <laughs> I think I've heard of it a couple times. All right, so we've got a nice group. I'm here in the Phoenix metro area, so we've been kind of struggling. My electricity grid went out. I don't know if there's so many electric vehicles here in my market where it shut down my grid here for the past half hour, but thank you two for joining me. I like to start out with one fun fact about my uh, expert panel each week. So, James, what's one fun fact about you that would surprise our global listening audience? Well, uh, there's probably more than one, but I'll I'll, I'll, uh, I'll pick beekeeping. I'm actually, I keep bees. So a few years ago, I had a couple hives and uh, my hobby's gotten a little out of control. So about 30 beehives that I manage right now. So just, uh, we're, uh, we're just at the end of the fall season here and we just harvested about 18 gallons of honey. So, so we've been doing over the weekend. So there you go. Oh my gosh, that is awesome. I need to get a picture of you in the beekeeper's outfit. That sounds pretty money. 
18 gallons, you said? Yes, 18 gallons. Oh, my gosh. That's amazing. Okay, Rocky, so we know we have – what's the official name of a, of a beekeeper? What's the technical term, James? Well, uh, you could be an apiarist or uh, a beak is the – if you see B-E-E-K on the back of somebody's okay. bumper, <laughs> they're a beekeeper. Okay. All right, so we've got ourselves, as James just uh, let me know, a beak. Uh, that's a great fun fact. Rocky, what's one fun fact about you, sir? Well, I was a paratrooper in Alaska, so I know all about the cold. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, it must be, I know it's really cold when you jump out of an airplane, but it must be really cold when you're jumping out of a plane in Alaska. Am I right? Yes. Yeah, it's not, it's surprisingly not very cold when you jump out of the air. <laughs> craft because you've got a lot of adrenaline going but it's when you hit the ground and have to spend two three weeks an expended period of time at 40 below 80 below it can be brutal okay so i'm assuming you'd have to start the process of innovation to keep yourself warm so let's start here on this topic here rocky so i'm going to start with you on this rocky so in the introduction leading up to this i talked a little bit about what we're calling the innovation imperative and i think a lot of our audience understands on a basic level why their organizations need to innovate but will you talk a little bit about what kind of problems are evident in a business when innovation is lacking yeah that's a really good question and i like to answer it two ways first um, at the macro level, you'll find that you're, you're slow to market, you're losing market share, your inventory is high, you um, can't keep up with the acceleration of data, and you've got high attrition. So those are things that executives will worry about, and those are indicators that they need to do some serious innovation. At the worker level, because innovation doesn't just happen at the C-suite, at the innovation, uh, at the worker level, it might look like heavy organizational bureaucracy or eight outdated processes or slow decision times or unsteady workflow. So those are some ways that the lack of innovation will present at the different levels. Okay, well, that makes a lot of sense. So, Rocky, here's my question to you. What's the value of a systematic approach to innovation? So what does that bring to the organization? Yeah, that's another good question. Um, many people think about innovations as their, the responsibility of the R&D department or the skunk works. And what innovations for us means is it's bringing new ideas that can help either have a big change or stack incremental changes, which will, to get, when looked at together, will have a big impact. My colleague, James, um, likes to say that if you want to get a great idea, all you need to do is have more ideas. So that leads us to the notion that Having a pipeline of ideas will help you get to better ideas, will help you solve those problems. I, um, Edison, for example, it took him a thousand tries to get the light bulb that he's famous for to figure out the filament, right? So um, it takes a lot of ideas and iterative steps on those ideas. Yeah, so what you're talking about is not waiting for the light bulb moment. It's working towards it, having the activity, failing forward, that kind of thing. So, James, we've heard Rocky talk about the environment. So can you now help us set up some parameters for winning? So, for example, what are the factors that need to be in place for an organization to succeed in their innovation efforts? Yeah, now before I answer that, I just want to make sure that uh, I don't take credit for Linus Pauling, one of the most famous American scientists <laughs> quote there, which I often do quote. So thank you, Rocky. But um, yeah, you know, that's I, good. So we're getting some proper citation. I like that. Right. Put a note somewhere. But uh, 
Yeah, you know, I think uh, one of the key things is that it really has to be a certain level of organizational ma maturity. Um, and, you know, one where you have teams that have, you know, basically the elements of high performing teams exist, things like the ability to, you know, take feedback constructively, you know, the use of data to drive decision making. You know, it doesn't have to be perfect, but to have those elements in place certainly is helpful. Um, also, I think it's a critical success factor that we have, you know, a leader or leaders that are supportive of, you know, experimentation. So it gives the team the space and room, you know, to do uh, experiments where sometimes, you know, you may fail, but hopefully fail forward. So again, this gives the teams permissions to think cr creatively and really stretch the boundaries of what they, what their normal work is like. And then I think lastly, really to have a, a spirit of innovation is important. So, you know, so if leaders nurture that and reward innovation, um, then that will drive the engagement of the team members and, you know, really create a culture of innovation where failure is just not some type of poison pill, which is often the case in organizations, uh, but instead it's really something that's embraced. And again, like I said, it's a way to fail forward and, and move more quickly. Oh, I love that. That is a great, um, a great philosophy. It's a great perspective. You're saying that needs to be in place. That's like the Petri dish, if we will, for innovation is having the culture and, and the attitude around it. And incidentally, gentlemen, I don't know if this is going to go on the podcast, but I have a mosquito that's buzzing around my office here. So if you see me kind of slapping wildly, <laughs> just, just know that's what the situation is. So I want to apologize in advance for that. But OK, so let's pick up on this here. We're getting to the fun part, gentlemen. So earlier this year, you two, and if I want to cite this correctly, along with our colleague Michelle Crow, one of GP's organizational design and change management consultants, wrote a fantastic post for the gpstrategies.com blog called, and I will quote, unleash your organization's innovation potential. So in that article, you introduced us to the concept of a test and learn factory. And if I'm going to sum this up here, I think I'll do my humble best is you, you kind of encapsulated it as a framework that almost any organization can use to generate a pipeline of ideas to accelerate their innovation. So is that a pretty fair summary, first of all? Yeah, I think so. Framework is a good, good way to talk about it. Acceleration, velocity high confidence, all of those um, come out of this framework. Okay. Okay. So then let's break this down because I like the idea. I think the biggest thing for most people when they hear something like this is they go, hey, I get it. Innovation is a big deal, but it's those first baby steps of how do you start kind of inching your way into this? So Rocky, in the article, I understand there's five stages to setting up a test and learn factory. So can you give us just a basic rundown on these various steps and then we'll kind of unpack them as we go? The first step is analyze where you're looking at data to determine and to define, get your arms around a problem, right? And figure out how to measure it. You don't really have your arms around it until you can measure it. The second stage is ideate. You just need to brainstorm, have some ideas, throw some um, ideas out there. The third step is to prioritize those ideas. And we like to look at um, three elements, if you will, the impact to the team or business. We like to prioritize based on the confidence of success that that idea will achieve its hypothesis. And third, how easy is it to implement? So we rate every idea based on those and the highest score wins, right? They, the higher the score, the higher the priority. The fourth um, component or stage is testing, which is actually, um, working with documenting all what you think is going to happen. It's kind of the scientific method. You identify a hypothesis, you give the thing a name, you um, look at a duration of the study, you understand the metrics well enough so you know whether or not it's been successful, and then you capture notes. And then the last 
area is reflect and adjust. So that's really conducting a retrospective and looking for ways to perhaps tweak your experiment to iterate on it. Hmm. Okay. Those are the well, five steps. those are those are five cool steps. I'm I'm really liking what you're saying here. But one thing that kind of surprising me a little bit about this is this first step of analyze. I mean, I would have kind of expected, you know, just thinking about my mind to have uh, the concept of analyze go after the test step. You know, for example, when the data is collected. So why do you think analyze should come first? That's a fair question, right? Um, when we come into a engagement with customers, we need to understand what problem they're trying to solve. Right. Okay. And that typically requires us to do some analysis. It's often times where somebody will say, I've got a problem and here it is. And it's uh, all tied up in a nice little bow. But in fact, once you start digging into the data, that's really not the problem that they want solved. So that's why we put it first. But it's very true that after you collect data from the test set, you've got to go back, look at that, look for insights, um, analyze the data, and um, come up with some results and some conclusions. So that's hmm. fair. Okay. okay. Well, I, I, I'm liking what you're saying here is w when you're talking about the factory, you're not just saying, let's innovate. You're saying, hey, let's look at the business and say, what are the problems here? What are the things devoid of technical prowess? Just what could be improved? What are you seeing are the pain points? And then you start to unleash the, the test and learn factor. Do I have that about right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Now I'm kind of, I'm getting that. Go ahead, James. Forgive me. Yeah, I was just going to say, and you touched on it, Rocky, is, you know, when, when we're asked to come and support one of our client partners, you know, it, 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 it's not that things are, you know, peachy king and working out, <laughs> you know, they, they, they kind of already dealing with problems. So that's that's another reason that analyzes right up front like that, because we really have to dig right in pretty quickly. Um, so, again, that was our thinking. Why and when should an organization put a test and learn factory into practice? So let's start there. Why and when should this be put into place yeah well let, let me start with the when uh you know so and i know you're not supposed to answer a question with a question but you know what i would <laughs> ask <laughs> i'll be a politician here i'll ask you a question i like it i like it but when do teams and organizations need a competitive advantage you know so i know that's like a rhetorical question but you know it's kind of like and rocky you quoted me earlier so i'll quote you now um you know he likes to say when's the best time to plant a tree and the answer is 20 years ago so when's the second best time to plant a tree? Well, that's that's right now. And that's really the answer to the question here. When, you know, when is it time to innovate, to, to succeed? And the answer is right now. So so that's that's the when piece of that. And then, you know, as far as the why part of your question, I mean, this this really just comes down to what organizations think they need to solve for with innovation. And at the beginning, Rocky mentioned some of those some of those things uh, of our discussion today. But you know, whatever their goals are, perhaps, you know, they need a competitive advantage in a market space, you know, or they're trying to, you know, seek a way to create a more dynamic, you know, work environment to drive employee engagement and to reduce turnover and, you know, think great resignation, right? I mean, that's just right in front of us. It's, it's happening right now. So you have to get creative. You need to drive innovation in order to be able to solve for some of those things. So, Again, it should be applied anywhere where more innovation is required. And then, you know, also I'll just emphasize this doesn't have to, it, it might sound like a large investment. It doesn't have to be a large investment. I mean, this isn't a major skunk works type of operation here. I mean, uh, we can start, we can start really small uh, and then scale from there, you know, depending on how it goes. As a matter of fact, you could even test and learn the test and learn factory <laughs> to see how it goes for you. Ooh, I like that. I like that. Now, Rocky, can I quote you on that about the the tree? Because I love that. I, I think we could make some T-shirts with that one. You can. I don't like James. I don't uh, claim it, but I can't find the original source of it. So it's it's going to you. you we've done our due diligence <laughs> here. So <laughs> no, these you've got great points here, James. What you're talking about is 
you know, when somebody looks at this concept of an innovation test and learn factory, sometimes it probably might almost feel like, oh my God, I'm trying to boil the ocean here. But what you're saying is no, right? It's it's more of the approach, it's the attitude. Yeah, the the investment can be darn near free, other than the the time of your staff to at least start devoting some time and attention to this. Do I have that about right? Am I kind of tracking there with what you're saying? Yeah, you sure do. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So Rocky, let me ask you this because we know that you are a seasoned organizational executive here. So um, yes, yeah, I, you're getting some chuckles out of here. So in your experience, uh, which stage is the most difficult for organizations to execute? So where do you see them struggling to pull off this concept of a test and learn factory? I think that the, for me and every place where I have implemented it, the most difficult place to uh, or the most difficult stage is the test stage where you have to document, where you have to hone the um hypothesis and you have to set up the experiment and you have to understand your metrics up front and all that's documented i think that many people don't have the patience for that and oftentimes companies don't have the discipline for it but the value of doing it will be that you can have again the high confidence evidence-based um, decisions, right? High confidence that something is working or that it's not working. And you can use that to identify best practices. And once you've got the best practices established, you can lift and shift those throughout the enterprise. So um, there's real value in doing the testing and doing the test and learn. Um, but I think the actual test stage where you've got to document all that stuff is the most difficult one. James, okay. I'd love to hear your point of view from your experiences. Absolutely. Any yeah, opinions I, I, there, James? Oh, sorry. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I, I totally agree with uh, what Rocky's saying. Uh, the, the testing piece is probably the most difficult thing for teams to wrap their head around. I mean, you start talking about, about you know, hypothesis and <laughs> You know, figuring out what data you're going to need to track in order to be able to, you know, see if things are working or not really is um, for most teams something different than their normal work experience. So weaving that piece into their regular cadence and their DNA is, is tough. But but I will say that once once teams get it, boy, they get it, you know, and uh, it actually starts to drive, you know, more of a, a data driven decision making, you know, mindset that I think we're mm. all trying to, to get to. So, so again, I'll agree with you on that one, Rocky. Yeah. It, you know, the word that perked up my ears, there was this concept of evidence based, right? By going through that rigor of testing and documenting, then you're creating a, a body of evidence that you can call back on, or you can even use as a launch pad, as you said earlier, Rocky, as it, it, to quote James, there is the best way to get new ideas is to work on a bed of ideas, almost like standing on the shoulders of giants, to quote Sir Isaac Newton, I believe, um, on that case. But um, you know what? I was kind of hoping that you gentlemen could bring forward a success story. I mean, one of the coolest things our listeners like to hear is also just some of these concepts in action. So, James, I'm going to put you on the spot here a little bit here. Um where have you seen this concept of the test and learn factory yield some positive results? So without naming names, can you share any examples with our listeners? Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, so so one, uh, one recent key example comes to mind. So, um, you know, I was helping support uh, a new HR team. This was a, a project management office team, so a PMO team. And um, they were getting stood up to manage just the myriad of you know, large scale enterprise wide projects and initiatives that were going on and to really ensure that those things were, you know, delivering the promised value, you know, in the, each of those initiatives kind of charters. So um, this team was set, set up to, to, you know, provide some oversight governance for that. And, you know, they were trying to figure out, well, how would they go about that? You know, how would they engage their stakeholders and keep leadership, you know, engaged and at the same time being able to have the credibility to, you know, go and, you know, do a little governance and, you know, monitoring of these different different uh, programs and initiatives that are going on. But, you know, 
long story short is by using the test and learn factory, the team was able to generate more ideas on how they could add value in a purposeful and data-driven way. Um, and, you know, in the beginning, they were really, you know, as they were forming, they were, you know, they got stood up, but they weren't really sure what direction they should go. So they needed this way to kind of throw some ideas out there and try some different things. And it ended up working out really, really well. I mean, once the process took hold, the team was generating more and more ideas over time. Um, and several of those ideas ended up really changing the way that the team was perceived by leadership as how they added value to the organization. I think, you know, at first they were just looked at kind of this oversight group, but then in the end, it turns out they took a far more active role in providing new and creative ways on how to maybe combine these initiatives and, you know, find more efficiencies and templatize things and whatever. There's just a lot of different ideas that came out of that. Um, and it, it even got to the point where this team was held up by the senior VP of the organization at their enormous, like all hands meeting, their annual all hands meeting. Um, and they were called out specifically um, for being, you know, a, an example, a role model team, uh, you know, il illustrating how to do innovation. So there you go. Well, I mean, selfishly, not only are you saying you're adding value to the business, but those that are seen as innovators, if you're just thinking about yourself as an employee, first of all, this could be a way to actually accelerate and advance your career if you really embrace this concept. I mean, I, that was kind of in my mind. It was also the other thing I was thinking about when when listening to you too is this is almost what people in the marketing world have been doing for years is the concept of test marking, right? Uh, you know, does a does a strawberry Sunday uh, in, in probably Wichita is a great place for a target market, right? Does does this taste fantastic, or is this something that we need to double down on, or is it something that we go, yeah, it, you know, the response was okay in in that area, so. Um, just kind of in my mind, you know. Yeah, I'll take all the strawberry sundays you want to send my way. <laughs> uh, I think you're onto something there, Mike. I mean, uh, members have gone off to other teams, and they have taken these concepts out to different organizations as they've gotten promoted and moved on to other things. So it really, you know, has been uh, something that has, you know, spread <laughs> throughout the organization. Is you have these little, uh, you know, advocates now that are running around the organization promulgating more uh, test and learn factories. Yeah, you said setting up a culture of it and that that culture, good or bad, starts to manifest itself there. So Rocky, my question to you would be this, do you see this concept of a test and learn innovation factory as a standalone framework? I do not, although you can employ it standalone. Um, that is to say that there are a whole host of entrepreneurs who work on social media and around the software development and build. And they do test and learn all the time. They do A-B testing. Does this feature work better for engagement or not? So it can work in isolation, but it doesn't have to. I uh, recently used it in a, a company where they were um, advancing the future of work. They were trying to fight against the fourth industrial revolution, right? And the great resignation. And to do that, they were bringing in some new way of thinking, trying to change um, how the entire population employee base looks at things, at challenges. And, and our task was A, to drive engagement to the learning and B, really shift the um, shift the 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 environment from a task oriented environment to something that's much much more nimble, and that's a learning environment, right? Where everybody wants to learn something, and if you learn, you're going to have more ideas. and And I believe that insights are really found at the um, edge of two different ideas. So I tip, I always read two books at one time because I find that my brain processes those and comes up with some innovations. But at this company, we used this test and learn process across their global market. So we would have one country test out 
do things to test out um, engagement for the new learning aspects and another country to do the same thing. We kind of gamified it so that at the end of each month, we would show who's ahead, who's getting close to their goals. We would have some goals. And um, at the end of the six month test period, we had found that those people who had more um, experiments actually improved their, um, their engagement. We found that those people who engaged in the content ended up being 3% more likely to be promoted than those who weren't. Those people who were engaged with the content were 10% more satisfied with working at this organization than those who weren't. So there were some real benefits. We did test some of the same experiments across countries to see if what worked in Spain also works in Mexico or if what works in Greece also works here in the US. So um, it was a really fun set of experiments and uh, well done. And we did find that of those um, com or those countries that were involved versus those that were not involved, we saw a significant um, increase in engagement. So their learning engagement number of people who were in, in fact taking these courses and they were reaching 80% of their population had been taking these courses. Whereas elsewhere in these non-experiment places, you were lucky to get into double digits at all. Right. So um, the experiments for us told that story that it's hugely beneficial. It doesn't need to be by itself. There's another GP podcast out there. Um, I'm sorry, blog out there that's called Creating Learning Momentum with your flywheel model. And that tells a story of another framework that we used in conjunction with this ex experiment in the um the story that I just told you. So it it's all about creating momentum and driving um, driving the engagement. Yes, hmm. uh, I I love this. This is I've been furiously scribbling notes. A couple things I wrote down just for myself to make sure that our listening audience doesn't lose it was the idea of reading two books at once to have the ideas converge. So first of all, that's a very cool <laughs> innovation nugget there, Rocky. That I'm going to have to put into practice. And this idea of, you said, it doesn't have to be a standalone framework. This is an approach. And as long as you're following those five best practices and you're, you're putting it in place, yeah, everyone's going to win on that side. Um, you two have been so generous with your time here. James, I want to ask you one final question, though. And that would be, are there any limitations to this idea of setting up an innovation test and learn factory? Yeah, I, re I really like that question. Um and I, and I hope that what Rocky and I have spoken about so far illustrates that this is is scalable. So, you know, what what I think we found is really most of the limitations are, are behavioral. You know, it's, you know, just willing to try something new and different. Um, but I will see say that you do need, you know, to be rigorous about creating ways to measure those experiments. And we've probably said that now three times. But, yeah, that, that's the piece that's that's critical. Um, you know, this is where, you know, something may not work. And, you know, as Rocky mentioned, uh, when we went through the five steps, you know, things need to be measured consistently. So, so really the limitation is ensuring that there is some level of rigor in place around the framework. And that might require, you know, someone to kind of Sherpa the process through a little bit of overhead there. Uh, doesn't, again, it doesn't have to be enormous, but, you know, you know, I'd say outside of that, you know, this is very adaptable. Um, you know, we just talked about, you know, is this standalone or can it fit in other frameworks? And a lot of what we do today is, you know, we're talking to teams about being more agile or achieving agility. Agile seems to be, you know, a big thing out there that we're working with. And, you know, part of being agile is, you know, conducting retrospectives and seeing what worked and what didn't and trying, you know, new things. And boy, I think a test and learn factory would, would fit nicely right in there. So, um, so again, I think it's very adaptable there, but yeah, I'd, I'd just say that that rigor being in place, a little bit of overhead, those are probably the main things. I once worked on another project in manufacturing <clears throat> where um, we put in a high performing team, which James talked about, and we allowed them to experiment within guidelines. They had given 
metrics um, boundaries, but they created and managed their metrics and they managed their hours to achieve metrics. And at the end of nine months, they brought back $14 million of profit to the company. And at, for profit sharing, they paid out a, a million dollars to the employees. So a net net, um, actually a net of uh, 13 million. So that worked great in nine months, but then at the end of those nine months, a new leader came in who was all about bean counting. And they said, oh, here's a million dollars we're given to our employees that we don't need to give to them. So they cut that off. The minute they did that, they lost the $14 million and the whole culture of innovation went down the tube and has been very hard for them to work its way back. So I think that leadership is, uh, you need to have leadership support. I, I think that's worth reflecting on. And if you think about it, what you're saying is having leadership look upon innovation as an investment, right? Y yes, there is going to be an investment, but the return can be multiples. You have in the article outlined five very realistic and achievable steps that, as you mentioned, aren't a framework that just fit narrowly within a given part of the organization. It's a mindset. It's an approach. And yes, as James, you mentioned, there takes some rigor. You have to have some rigor, but you have laid out the guide rails in the article. So gentlemen, on behalf of our global listening audience, I want to thank you both for carving out some time and sharing your insight today. We appreciate you so much. The Performance Matters podcast is brought to you by GP Strategies. Together, we can create a world where business excellence makes possibilities achievable. You can subscribe to the show anywhere you get podcasts or listen on our website at gpstrategies.com.